good evening. Um, tonight's session on the master class series brought to you by the AO North America Hand Education Committee is, is a fantastic session uh, by Hill Hastings, who I consider not only a, an old friend, but a mentor and a great philosopher and guide to me in my career. For those of you who are joining us from uh, Ortho TV, welcome and uh, good morning wherever you are in Asia. And tonight's moderator is going to be Jeff Lawton. This session is the last in this series for this year. And starting next year, we'll resume the series in January. Um, and we'll go on for another seven to eight weeks. So with that being said, I will hand it off to Jeff. All yours, buddy. Thanks, Chai, and welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you who have been with us all along, welcome back. And for those of you who just happened upon us, uh, I'm confident you're going to love what you see tonight. So uh, as uh, Chai said, we're joined tonight by our, our master um, to speak on hemihamate replacement arthroplasty. Um, Chai is the chair of the North American Hand Education Committee. And uh, with his energy, we put together really a, a dramatic uh, slate of programs for you. Um, again, tonight, Hill Hastings is gonna share with us uh, a lot that he's learned over the years in developing this technique. Uh, I'm going to introduce the topic. Um, Emil uh, Dionysian is going to be um, helping us with question and answers. And then uh, Scott Gould, uh, one of the therapists from the Indiana Hand to Shoulder Center is gonna be giving us uh, some insights into the rehab and therapy. Uh, just a few words before we get started. Our um, uh, conflicts of interest have all been addressed and here they are listed. None of them has direct conflict. Um, this is a, a schedule for tonight. We're going to start with uh, a case to introduce the topic, and then obviously the bulk of this time is going to be Hill um, talking about uh, hemihemate replacement arthroplasty, and then wrapping up with Scott Gould talking about the rehab, and then we'll get back to the case. Uh, and then Emil is going to introduce some questions for Dr. Hastings. AO, as many of you know, is an independent nonprofit educational organization, doesn't endorse any specific products, uh, and the equipment and the implants are talking about uh, using as purely for educational purposes. Just a word on Zoom etiquette, all the microphones have been muted and the videos turned off. However, we do want to interact with you, and we'd like to do that through the Q&A function. So anyone that's got any questions, um, Emil uh, will go through those and perhaps answer some directly to you. And then we, time allowable, may present some to Dr. Hastings for his impressions and, and his thoughts. Uh, these are our learner objectives throughout the series, um, and these are followed through each of these presentations. Um, as Chai said, this is the last of our series that's going to wrap up uh, before the holidays and then beginning in January. As you see, we have a tremendous slate by world-renowned uh, educators, uh, as you see, running through early April. Uh, so it's, it's every other week on a, on a Thursday. Um, so uh, as you know, uh, we, uh, AO has its uh, YouTube channel. So this will be uh, available. The recorded session will be available on the YouTube channel um, and then also streaming on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and Google. So uh, to introduce the topic, uh, not surprising given the topic, this is a 16 year old young lady who had a remote injury to her left ring finger. Uh, as you can see, again, not a surprise, she's got a PIP fracture subluxation and her ring finger is sort of pointed askew. You sort of get the sense from the cascade from her index and middle finger, which way you would expect the ring finger to go and sort of between the, the uh, middle and the small. Uh, so you'd expect it to be there. Again, looking at uh, some three-dimensional imaging, here's a CT scan with a couple of cuts showing her PIP fracture subluxation. So um, in preparation for the hemihamate arthroplasty, um, we do the, the shotgun approach and Hill will talk about that. And so what you're looking at is the PIP joint with the uh, head of the proximal phalanx here and the base of the middle phalanx and you see the denuded uh, devitalized articular cartilage at the base. So uh, we take her uh, ipsilateral hamate 
as graphed and as so eloquently described by Dr. Hastings, uh, Peter Stern, and our own John Capo of uh, formally, immediately formally of the Hand Education Committee, um, taking the uh, dorsal portion of the base of the hamate uh, to reconstruct the base of the middle phalanx. So uh, Dr. Hastings is now going to talk with us about his inspiration, some indications and contraindications, um, perhaps some questions about when is it too late and uh, the role in acute injuries, um, some tips and tricks on surgery from Dr. Hastings, and then follow, following that will be some tips and tricks on the rehab uh, from Scott Gould. So Hill, if you want to start sharing. Dynamite. Thank you, Jeff. Well, it's an honor, honor to be with you all today, this evening. Um, so this is my charge. Yes, hemi-hamate replacement arthroplasty. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, I have no direct conflicts with this little teeny joint. Well, to set the stage, I'd like to take a moment and honor uh, Jim Gary, uh, who unfortunately passed away after some heart problems some 10 days ago. Um, he he is, was an integral part of developing AO in North America. So he started at Synthes in the very pioneer days. Uh, his work led to him being an honorary AO trustee. And along that 34 year stint, uh, he encouraged and facilitated interaction between AO surgeons and a group of North American pioneers that many of you know. Um, this was an era where internal fixation was not really a thing in the United States, and he kind of shepherded and helped shepherd uh, this uh, into what we know now, and he was one of the critical individuals that really created AO North America in 1992, so we owe a lot of what we're doing tonight uh, to his work and creativity and passion, and throughout his career, uh, he was a strong ad advocate for education and fellowships. So thank you, Jim, Gary, we miss you. So this is, this is what we're talking about. Typically, this is a ball sport. It's an axial load. It's an injury to the, to the end of the digit that then drives the digit into some flexion and the axial load drives it out dorsally. And then the head of the proximal phalanx crushes into the articular base of the middle phalanx to varying degree. And I'll talk about that varying degree in just a minute. So this is just a rendering of someone who has a PIP fracture dislocation. You can see how the axes of the middle phalanx do not line up with the middle phalanx. And yes, it can be reduced. So this is just a rendering of the same x-ray in, in a reduced fashion. But what remains variable is what happens to this depressed palmar portion of the articular surface. In most cases, it's crushed in and does not reduce. But what does that mean? Well, a whole talk could be given on just PIP fractures and dislocations and actually how to handle many of these apart from hemihamate. But along the way, I'll try to identify for you why and how these PIP fracture dislocation treatments, variant treatments that have been applied, can fail, what the indications and contraindications for this procedure are, I'll go over some surgical planning and technique, briefly some results. And then lastly, importantly, I think I'll, I'll show you some tips and pearls from what I've had to learn the hard way. Hard way. So Tom Kefauber and Peter Stern modified my initial classification for stability of the PIP joint. And those that involve less than 30% are stable and stable and congruent through a full range of motion. Beyond that, you get into this intermediate zone, which we call tenuous, and somewhere between 30 and 50% of the articular base. But the important thing is they reduce with less than 30 degrees of flexion. And then the third category are these truly unstable ones that involve 50% or more. But at times, it looks like less than 50% but nevertheless requires marked flexion to maintain reduction, flexion more than 30 degrees. So here's just a, a drawing that I've put up showing what looks like a 50% injury. So if you look at the right, this right lateral view or sagittal view, um, I've marked out a 50% 50, 50 injury. 
But if you look at the at these axial views, there's a portion of the silhouette that you're looking at on the lateral X-ray that is above the true Conler facet uh, of the base of, of middle phalanx. So if you look here, basically this is more like a 70 or 75 percent injury to the joint, even though it looks like only 50 percent on the lateral on the lateral view. This variable zone between 30 and 50 or 40 and 60 is variable for a number of reasons. And, and the reasons are with just plain X-ray, um, not CT. CT can be very helpful in elucidating this, but in, in just plain X-ray, what may appear to be a 50% injury actually results from some deviation with the mechanism of injury that fractures and compresses one side of the joint more than the other. So for example, you may see as on this axial view that it's a 50 or 60% of the joint on one facet, but only 30% on the other side. And this may, this may in, indeed be relatively stable because one facet of the articular base in fact is less than 50%. So just on plain x-rays, it can be difficult to really understand how much of the joint is involved and some thin slice CTs can help you decide can help you decide that. So these unstable ones are the are the problem ones. So more than 40 or 50 percent and ones that require marked flexion. So you can figure this out in the operating in the in the emergency room. You can digitally block, reduce the patient, and then under floral, see the point at which uh, which it wants to dislocate as you go from flexion to extension. And in many of these, you can, you can simply handle it by flexing the joint to a point of stability, blocking it with a K-wire. If there's depressed portions that don't reduce, you can make a small drill hole in the side of the middle phalanx and with a K-wire under floral, elevate some of those depressed elements. Uh, ones that are very complicated and certainly ones that are late that have already scarred in, uh, can oftentimes be handled well with, our, with open reduction internal fixation. And within the confines of this talk, there are a number of patients that you may not sh be sure whether they really need something more than just a, an internal fixation. So oftentimes you may end up going in to fix the joint and then find that it's too splintered, there are too many pieces, you can't fix it, but oftentimes you can fix it. I think all of you know of a variety of, we, of techniques for dynamic external fixation that can be used for this. In late cases, uh, Norm Zemmel described an osteotomy to reduce back into position the compressed fragment. And then I'll talk a little, I'll talk a little bit about, about Palmer plate arthroplasty and where that has a role in, this, in the spectrum of this injury. So back in 1980, Mallarch and Eaton in their paper described, and I'll quote, with disrupt, disruption of greater than 40% of the velar articular surface of the middle phalanx, it's unlikely that a congruous stable reduction can be achieved. That tenet still holds today, um, some you know, 40, 40 years later. So these were the initial results of, the, of this paper in 1980 that popularized volar plate arthroplasty. It was a 10-year study, and you can see that the acute cases, seven of, them, uh, seven of them, fared better than the 17 late cases. So all too often, these are neglected injuries uh, that, come, that come in late. The tenets in this paper were to excise, not release, but excise the collateral ligaments, uh, reduce the joint back into position, hold it with a pin for two weeks or so, and then progressively start working on extension in, in the three to five week frame. And as noted in that previous slide, 19 of the 24 had contractures that required some effort with dynamic splinting. Well, back in the 80s, we had really unpredictable results with this and it remained unclear why some of these failed and why some of them worked. And we had you know, a series of grand rounds and Dick Eaton came to Indiana and we had three cases that we operated the following day with him. This is one of my cases, which on removal of the K-wire went on to re-dislocate. So because 
many of these cases unpredictably failed or redislocated after removing the K wire. And also because late cases were stiff and had poor results, we wondered if just applying an external fixator for sustained reduction would allow for this operation to really work and also for allow for early range of motion. So along this line, uh, John Ernst and I looked at the instant centers of motion for the PIP joint and found them to be a relatively tight focus within, a, within one millimeter, as this black arrow shows between the accessory and proper, between the two portions of the proper collateral ligament dorsal to the accessory collateral ligament. And so we applied this in a, in a number of cases and Disappointingly, we found when articular involvement was more than 50%, when we took the fixator off, the, 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 the joint went into repeat subluxation. So this was unfortunately not, a, not an answer for this. It, it did lead us to use this technique in other situations. Early on, I reported uh, my results with these dorsal fracture dislocations with good range of motion. But note that the average articular surface was really just 40 or 50%. And whether that's really accurately determined, it's hard to know. And I think in Eaton's initial paper, it was hard to know which cases those molar plate arthroplasties were applied, applied to. In fact, if you apply it to someone who has a 30, 40% that's been dislocated, they come in late. Once you reduce, once you release the collaterals or excise them and reduce the joint, you've re returned it back to that stable category and it will work. Um, the same technique was applied uh, with hinge fixators by the Cincinnati group. And so they looked at 20 patients uh, combining ORIF or volar plate arthroplasty with the fixator. Um, and they found that six of the 20 had recurrent subluxation. So what, why is this? Why does one paper show results that work and in other hands it doesn't work? Uh, when can you expect success and when can you anticipate failure? So to explore this, Ward, Hamlet, and I took a cadaver model. You kind of see it shown here, uh, held in and under fluoroscopy. So we had 24 digits and we variably created Palmer defects from 25 to 50 to 70%. And then on top of that, we either left the collateral li ligaments intact. Some people thought the collaterals were, were supportive of joint reduction, or we sectioned the collaterals, or we sectioned the collaterals and totally dislocated the joint. So this shows just an incision between the proper collateral ligament and the volar plate. So a minimal resection, this is a stable, you know it's gonna be stable. You can take this joint through a full range of motion all the way into extension is stable. Here, 30, 40%, same thing, totally stable. But once you get up to about 50%, it's stable up into extension, but then as the flexors try to pull, there's nothing to guide it into flexion. It simply hinges on that apex because there's nothing really to help guide it down into flexion. And so if you look at from the outside, what it really looks like with that 50%, it's stable up into extension. But then as the combined forces try to flex the joint, it pops into what typically you see as a fracture subluxation. So this is what we found. So less than 42% joints were universally stable all through in a complete range of motion. And then progressively, the more bone that, that is lost, the more flexion you have to put the joint in to keep it stable. Um, so if you create a flexion contracture, uh, you can keep some of these joints stable, but once you get up to 60% of the joint, these joints universally are unstable, even in marked flexion. So, these, so basically what Dick Eaton said is correct, less than 40 or 42%, these joints are stable. The more bone you lose, the more severe you have to create a flexion contracture to maintain them in, in a stable, stable position. And in fact, the collaterals play no role to dorsal volar stability. So we, we found that with the collaterals intact or not intact, all these joints were equally stable or unstable. So this is, this is kind of my depiction of, of why volar plate arthroplasty can be unstable because all you have left is just the dorsal part of the joint and the axis starts to slide dorsal to the axis point of flexion and extension. 
And so you pin it, and then when you pull the pin out, you still don't have the basic requirements. And if you look at this slide, basically all you have left is kind of the dorsal slope of the joint. And there's nothing to kind of force it back down uh, along the contour of the proximal phalanx into flexion. The volar plate orthoplasty certainly can and does work. Um, I believe that a lot of Eaton's initial series were patients that had lesser involvement. They presented, you know, you saw the majority of them were, were late. So they required an opera procedure to release the joint to get it back into position. And then once it back, it's back into position, it will work if it's less than 40%. It also will work if the amount of depression in the volar base is, is no greater than the thickness of the distal part of the volar plate. So you know the distal part of the volar plate is one and a half to two millimeters thick. So if the depressed area is only depressed by two millimeters or less, when you interpose the volar plate, it makes up for that amount and it restores, in fact, the proper buttress. Uh, the joint can actually function. So if you've had failed palmar plate orthoplasties, you'll see it like this, where it kind of hinges and it basically flexes and extends on that apex between the intact dorsal part and the absent palmar part. And it will also serve as a block to extension. You won't be able to fully extend. So Jeff, Jeff asked to, for me to give what the inspiration for this was. So it was a it was an evolving inspiration, I should say, but one of them was close to my heart, which was a good friend that came to ride hunter jumpers on my farm, fell off and, and had a fracture dislocation. And you can see here that even in 80 degrees of flexion, we have what we call a, a V sign where the, there's still a gapping in the dorsal part of the joint. So even in 80 degrees, this joint is not truly reduced. Um, so having had this experience, this goes way back, um, what we thought we might do is put in a bone graft, as you see here, and then sculpt that bone graft into kind of a bifaceted replication of the articular base and recess just enough that the volar plate would fit into that and serve as a fiber card latchness resurfacing with a solid buttress. This is a pretty typical picture like Jeff just showed you of the, of the injury. You can see the head of the proximal phalanx with, with the injury to the head of the proximal phalanx. And you can see there's a major part of the volar base that, that's been crushed in and is, is truly absent, it's not repairable. This is the graft. And I wasn't that smart, I'm not that much smarter now, but I used the radial styloid and you can see it in position before sculpting it to create a little room for the volar plate and to create the proper curvature of the joint. And this is his joint, this is his motion some six or eight weeks out. Decent extension and decent flexion. So we were pretty happy that this as a concept was one way to, one way to handle this. This slide you, you'll laugh at, it'll give you a clue on how old this case is. This was the smallest screw we had back in those days, a 2.0 screw. You can see the pretty dense radial styloid. And as we followed him along, you can see that the graft started to resorb and then sequentially as the graft resorb, the joint then re-subluxated or re-dislocated. So the buttress worked, but when the buttress disappeared, the joint again was unstable. So from this, we went through a series of osteochondral grafts from the toes. And then Bruce Steinberg, who was working with me at that point, went to the lab to look at what might be available in a regional or, or nearby basis for replacement and came up with looking at the, the fourth and fifth carpometacarpal joints. And looking at the sagittal view, as you see on the upper right here, you can see that the hamate provides a curved surface. And as Jeff has shown, you can take the dorsal part, flip it into position and use it as osteochondral replacement to what's been crushed in, not reconstructable or missing. These are some pictures from Bruce uh, Steinberg's laboratory work. On the left, you see we've created a defect. 
the middle shows an axial view showing kind of the similar contours and shapes of the hamate and the base of middle phalanx. And on the right, you see K wire simply holding this graft into position. And lo and behold, it immediately stored, restored joint stability. Additional fixation was not required. And it suggested we could move, move this, these, patients, these patients early. So the hamate, is a suitable osteochondral graft. It is similar, I'll, I'll emphasize similar, because the radius of curvature is larger than the curvature at the base of the middle phalanx. It, it does present a bicondylar facet. It replicates that bicondylar anatomy of the base of middle phalanx. It's, it's sizable enough that you can take it and, and easily fix it with screws. And it's a local autogenous graft from the same operative site that, that makes sense. The first case I did, I pinned the carpal metacarpal joints. After that, we realized that we didn't need to. Uh, we were worried initially whether we had created some instability at the fourth and fifth carpal metacarpal joints. Along this line, John Capo and colleagues, along with me and Bruce, uh, looked at instron testing of, in the lab of the joint after harvesting. And yes, there's some mild subluxation, only about 5.3%, and the greatest 12% uh, under fluoroscopic exam, but this was under a relatively large load, 22 newtons that we don't typically see. And, and if you talk to everyone that's applied this technique, I don't think hardly anyone has ever seen any problems with the fourth and fifth carpal joints. Our reassurance was, well, if we got into problems, we could do a carpal fusion, which as you know, functions well, given the proximal surface of the hamate still providing motion and suppleness to the ulnar side of the hand. So what are the indications? Well, they're comminuted, unstable palmar lip fractures, uh, both acute and unfortunately all, all too commonly neglected or chronic. Sometimes you'll see just a single lateral plateau where it can be applied and unfortunately, it often is used as a salvage after failed attempt by external fixation, RAF, or palmar plate arthroplasty. I don't know the true, true contraindication. So I'll emphasize again later, there's always, almost always injury to the head of the proximal phalanx. And does this lead to pre-injury arthritis? I'll show you an extreme example uh, here coming up. Um, you, you definitely need uh, adequate flexors and extensors. You'd need soft tissue coverage. And then somewhere in the equation, we'll talk about with therapy, you need the ability of the patient to cooperate with post-operative therapy. Any of you that have done a shotgun approach to the PIP joint know that you, you take down a lot of tissues to do that, and you have to overcome that with post-operative therapy. So is this joint too gone? This is this patient presented, I don't know, a long time after fracture dislocation. You can see what's left of the volar base just flexing, is just riding on the dorsal head of the middle phalanx. And this is, this is one of the early cases. It's applied with uh, some smaller screws. You can see the defect that's missing in the head of the proximal phalanx, but in flexion extension, this still functioned re reasonably well. How do you do this? I use a little bit of a modified Bruner. I kind of extend it for a little distance at the PIP joint. All, almost all of these are stiff. They lack extension and flexion. It's the middle finger you can see swollen. Um, regional block. I think it's helpful to get the other fingers out of the way. So I usually use Curlex or, or, or Cling to just get the other fingers out of the joint. You know, with the joint subluxated, the, the, the nerves are gonna be more prominent. So as you raise this flap, you have to be careful because they're gonna be more prominent. We raise a retinacular flap between the A2 and A4 pulleys. Then I leave the tendon directly in place and just incise on either side of the volar plate. So that really releases the accessory collateral insertion on the volar plate. And then it's helpful with a little beaver blade distally to undermine from one side the distal attachment of the volar plate and then on the other side. And then you have to release the ligaments. I don't excise them. I just subparosely release them by sweeping a 15 blade along proximally. You may have to use a freer, freer elevator to remove scar in the dorsal part of the joint, uh, 
and then progressively you can extend it as you see here. And you can see there's very little of the joint still missing, still present on the on the middle phalanx. Um, so there's some small bits and pieces, nothing that's that's repairable or reducible. I, I changed my technique a little bit, so we'll measure it, you know, AP width and radial ulnar width to get an idea of the size of the handmate that's needed. This shows preparing the recipient defect. I, I wait now and do this later, but after, after resecting it to a nice box-like recipient uh, area, then an incision. I used to make transverse incisions like Jeff showed you. Uh, I think it's easier to do a little longitudinal incision and then you just go between the extensors uh, down to the joint and then subperiosteally release the capsule off the copper metacarpal joint, and this is what this is what you get. Now, part of the trick is is getting the graft out. It's a little fiddly, so I make sagittal cuts radially and ulnarly, and then proximally. And then, as this shows, a an osteotome into the joint. Once you kind of propagate past the subchondral level, it tends to propagate itself proximally. The joint's stable. I usually just put some gel foam in as, a, as to close off the space, uh, repair the capsule back. The key ligaments are all palmar. So the, after you do this, you can stress the joint. The joint remains stable uh, and, and it's, a, it's a simple closure at this point. Now this is the fiddly part. So a little coker, you put it into position, you see what it is, and then sequentially you fine tune the recipient and the graft. And I'll show you a little bit about the key comp components of doing that. I typically use a 0.028K wire centrally to fix it into position. You can see that the curvature has been recreated. I could repeat that a dozen times. The curvature has been recreated. And if you want, you can, you can test the stability at that point. This is a 0.076 uh, drill, uh, which drills for, the uh, 1.0 screw, and then you overdrill with 1.0, uh, measure the depth, and then put it in an appropriate screw. I usually use three screws, uh, three 1.0 millimeter screws, but you can go up to 1.3 as needed. So this is just fixing fixing the graph with the with the screws, and it's a sizable enough piece. It's a teeny piece, but it's sizable enough that screw fixation in most instances works really well. This shows it in shows the reconstruction with the sagittal ridge between the two facets in position. This shows repairing the collateral ligament, uh, uh, the collateral insertion back to the volar plate or vice versa. Um, there's always decent tissue in this area. The distal part of the volar plate is pretty thick. Um, repairing it back into position on, on both sides. This just shows under floral uh, flexion and extension. This joint might be a little flatter than, critically than, than I would really like, but it was functional for this patient. So it's immediately stable. You can, you can pretty aggressively take it through flexion extension. You know it's gonna remain stable. It gives you assurance that you can deal with, it, deal with that stability postoperatively. I always let the tourniquet down um, to favor range of motion afterwards. So put the tourniquet down, get good hemostasis uh, before closing. So you know there's nothing that's gonna compromise your, your ability to really apply good therapy afterwards. So dab, bovi, dab, bipolar. This is the reconstruction as, it, as you see finished here. Uh, full flexion, and there should be full extension too. I don't think there's a problem fully extending. I do like to put a digital compressive dressing on in addition to to start with uh, up further up to incorporate the hand and wrist just for comfort. So for the first three to five days, Scott will talk to this talk to us more about this than a, a supportive dressing as you see here. So here's another patient. This came in to my then partner Rick Eidler. And the question is, is this patient too late? Um, here you can see arthritic change. You can see there's more involvement on one, con one side of the joint than the other. Uh, this is his 
uh, position. You can see there's some in condylar entry to the head of the proximal phalanx right here. And here you see the sculpted defect. This is the hamate in position, matching up pretty perfectly in this situation. And you almost wouldn't know that it's not his native joint in this situation. So this is probably one of the better matches that, that you'll see. And then here he is at eight weeks after surgery. I'd say most of them lack full extension. So he has pretty much full flexion, I would say, but if you're critical, he doesn't have full extension either. It's his index finger in this case. And he functioned well. In fact, I was going to the Philly hand course and I got shouted down in the concourse in the airport and he chased me down. He was traveling too and found me and sh showed me how he was doing. So it's easier for small defects and it becomes harder with larger percentage defects as you see here. And that's because the curvature of the hamate is, is larger than the curvature of the joint. So when it's 30 or 40%, that relative difference is pretty inconsequential. But when you get up to 70%, that difference in curvature becomes more consequential. And because of that, it takes even more scrutiny to make sure that you tip that graph well enough so it serves as a good uh, volar buttress. So this is that patient, again, with decent flexion, decent extension, but not full extension. Just a couple slides on outcomes. This was our early paper uh, looking, at, looking at 10 patients. You can see they didn't have full extension, but they had good flexion. Scott will talk a little bit about more about what you really need for a functional PIP joint. Uh, the original Cincinnati experience, an arc of motion of 87 degrees, and both these series 100% union and no AVN. Uh, a subsequent uh, series in 2009 from the Cincinnati group, 33 patients. Again, you can see the acute patients did better than the chronic patients, uh, but little functional impairment and good strength, and only one of these 33 patients required revision. Uh, Berdan's and colleagues, 17 patients, two ended up requiring a silicone PIP orthoplasty. Uh, the rest, no instability or chronic pain. Uh, Ram Krishnan and journal plastic surgery, six patients who were late. Uh, many of mine were also late, more than 100, 100 days, all good results in a series from Mina and colleagues in Rajasthan, 25 patients. One of these 25 was revised for a loose screw. There's a small series from Greece, a friend, a friend of some colleagues with greater than four year follow up. And important to note by x ray, severe arthritis in two, mild in, in two, but only one of these patients really had troublesome pain. And then Bernier, 19 patients, uh, underscoring operative findings that there were mirror injus, injuries to the head of the proximal phalanx, pretty much in all, in all patients. And again, no donor problems. So what are the what are the problems? What are the challenges? Well, it is a fiddly operation. You know, you got to be you got to be a teeny weeny hand surgeon to do this operation or to put up with it because it requires artistry in a small graft. Um, as opposed to that radial styloid graft that I initially showed you, these do incorporate, and I and I suspect they survive because because the it's more of a cancerous bone structure, the hamate. Uh, that allows for rapid uh, vascularization. And very importantly, if properly done, it, it corrects the shear forces that normally lead to, to cartilage destruction. So I've changed things over time and, and like everything you learn from your mistakes. So I'll talk a little bit about what I've learned that might make your life a little bit easier on how to make this operation work if you're faced with having to do it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we've changed in harvesting, timing, uh, how you handle these big defects, and then and so on. So I, I used to use uh, little rulers to measure it. I honestly think it's faster and quicker just to grab off your handset osteotomes that come in various sizes and just apply an osteotome uh, to, to the defect. You can quickly pick two, two, two osteotomes, one for the AP direction and one for the radial ulnar direction. It also is helpful to preoperatively think about x-raying the opposite identical digit. So you have an, an idea for how big 
the AP diameter should be. It's easy to over reconstruct or to put in a graph that recreates too large of an AP dimension. So I, I now also harvest the graft and then I wait to prepare the recipient bed until I've harvested the ham mate. Um, if the ham mate doesn't come out perfectly or exactly as you want, it gives you a little bit more leeway in fine tuning the, fine -tuning the bed. Uh, so this shows basically the carpal, the fourth and fifth carpal metacarpal joint. So I draw it out. I use a small sagittal saw, radiant ulnarly, and usually this goes almost always over to the ulnar side of the hamate. Um, I don't think there's a problem taking the entire width of the hamate. Some people have considered coming in with an osteotome from the ulnar side, but in most instances, you're going to find the appropriate size is going to come all, almost all the way over to the margins of the hamate. And sometimes, I'm sure you've found this in your own practices, you, you change what you do based upon one case. So I had a case where when we osteotomed inside the joint, the graft shot up out of the operative field. I'm down on my hand and knees on the floor trying to find it. We finally found it up on, a, on one of the operative lights. <laughs> and so subsequent to that, I've started taking out just a little wedge of bone proximate. So I make a little sliver of bone uh, proximate to, to give the area the ability to decompress. Those of you who have done it know that there is variable laxity to the metacarpal joint. Sometimes you can put an osteotome in easily, sometimes not, more, more often than not. Uh, these were osteotomes that I had made up for this procedure early, earlier in, in my experience with it. Uh, where you simply could move it in and you could pry it. And as I've said earlier, once you get through the chondral and subchondral bone, it'll basically propagate in that coronal plane for the rest, for the, rest of the way. I believe it was not Lottie Neji in, in Switzerland that said, well, Hill, you know, you're taking out this part. Why don't you just take out the dorsal base of the, of the metacarpal? And so that led to a much easier way to harvest the graft because that part's no longer going to articulate anyway. And it gives you much better access and the proper angle as it's shown here for harvesting the graft. So what are the tricks? Well, the trick is to tip the graft properly. And to do that, you need to prepare the hamate and the base of middle phalanx properly. And I'll show you a little bit about what that means. So on the, it's easier if you come in on the left x-ray from proximal to distal, it's harder on the right coming in from the joint. But once you remove the dorsal base of the fourth and fifth uh, metacarpals, the, the x-ray on the right becomes quite doable. So in order to facilitate tipping the graft, in general, the AP width at the joint should be less than the AP joint, AP distance proximally. So this is kind of the shape that we're, that we're aiming for. So here the other day, I drew out some potential. So if you took the graft in this easy way, as you see here, it's not going to really fit in and appropriately create that curvature. If you cut it, as I've shown here, then all of a sudden you got a graft that's going to recreate that curvature properly. And then you also have an opportunity, other than creating a true box-like structure, you can cut what's left of the volar base at an angle, and that will also facilitate tipping the graft. Here you can see applying this first graft, it comes out much better even in this scenario. I also leave a distal buttress to the graft. So as I put the graft in, I will, it'll be more prominent and slowly I will trim down the distal part until the cartilage lines up properly. And then this buttress here holds it securely in fashion. And in fact, in many instances, you can put the graft in and then reduce the joint and you can take it through a range of motion. It will hold itself in position pretty much that way. I mentioned using a provisional 0.028 K wire. This is the nominal core diameter of a 1.1 millimeter, 1.0 millimeter screw. So when you remove that that provisional fixation, you have all, essentially already drilled for a 1.5 millimeter screw, um, and you can simply apply it. Um, 
I also think you should apply the screws close to the joint, but not too close. The better bone is right near the joint. Uh, this shows a 1.3 millimeter screw. I think my other slide was in error. The, it's a 1.0 that it was in that last case. But a 1.3 has a little bit bigger head. So if you were to swap out and decide to use a 1.3, this one screw needs to be back further away from the joint that the head doesn't, doesn't really bother it. There are a few instances where screws alone are not enough. So one scenario listed on the top here is when there's only a small amount of bone dorsally. So this case is not exactly that, but in a 70% injury, you're only gonna have a small amount of bone up here and the fixation of the screw may allow for tog toggling and loosening. So that's one situation where screws alone may not work. The second situation is exampled here. This is a, a Michigan hockey player. Uh, and I felt of questionable reliability. First, he was gonna come from Colorado back to home. I wouldn't be able to follow him. Secondly, he showed up with his pants partly hanging down and I wasn't sure how reliable he was gonna be after surgery. And then thirdly, as we tip the graft, we still had a little bit of a defect or void that created less stability. We didn't have this true distal buttress. And so we applied a small 1.3 millimeter plate, a mesh plate that's cut down to size. Uh, these, are, these are films sent to me at eight, eight weeks follow-up. You can see decent flexion and still missing some extension at this point. Um, also, if you apply the screws proximally, it'll give you the chance to remove part of this apex more distally. So the graph's always gonna be a bit prominent distally and it allows you to trim away part of this distal bone if the screws are in the more proximal part of the graft. Those of, the, of you that have done it will notice that as on this case, there seems to be a little bit of offset and that's because the cartilage thickness of the middle phalanx is thinner than the cartilage thickness of the hamate, so that's normal. You always have good tissue to repair the volar plate back to. This shows repairing the lateral margin of the volar plate to the base of middle phalanx, right where your collateral ligaments insert. So you just need to make sure that you get good tissue there and you avoid the digital nerve as you place the suture. It's been my routine to reflect this retinacular flap deep to the flexors. I don't know that that's critical. I don't even know if you need the flap, but my routine has been to just put it deep to the flexors as an additional reinforcement superficial to graft. Now here's one of the issues. The, there is variability of the hamate. So I showed you some that work perfectly. Here, here are a number of, of grafts that don't look absolutely perfect, but they function as, a, as an ad, adequate buttress. Paul Benhammer and colleagues looked at this through three-dimensional laser scanning of the carpal metacarpal joints. And basically the radius of curvature of the fourth was similar, very similar to that of the fifth. But the dorsal part of the hamate at the fourth carpal metacarpal joint in six of the 10 cases did tend to flatten a bit. Most cases do hold up over time. So here's a patient, again, many of these are late injuries. He came to me almost six months out after injury. He'd fallen out of the tree platform deer hunting. And you can see him kind of impacted and dislocated. And here's the situation eight and a half years out after injury. And this is his motion. I don't know when, but sometime down, down the road, good extension and good flexion. So the take home, the PIP joint to require, does require this palmar buttress for stability. That is the key thing. And less than 30% when it's gone, it's a no-brainer. You can handle it with a dorsal block splint. If it's less than 30 40% and you see them at two or three months and they're out, if you go in, release the collaterals, release the scar, get the joint back into position, again, you can treat it as a fairly simple fracture dislocation and it'll work. What's, what the problem ones are those that, that are, are, are more, more involved than that, where you have to apply one, uh, uh, various other techniques. Many times these can be percutaneously handled or by external fixation. Uh, but when there's more than 40 to 50%, more often than not, you're going to need some effort to restore the palmar buttress. And at this point, the hemi hamate fits the requirement better than, than what other methods I've seen.
this is the key thing. If I had to emphasize one thing 15 times, uh, you have to tip the graft. When I've seen cases sent to me where patients have had problems, it's failure, it's failure to really restore back this good curvature. Uh, so again, you need to ideally have a graft that's thicker distally than proximally or, or tailor in a slope fashion your, your recipient defect so it favors, favors that tip. Uh, most of these, I think, really do hold up, and most, most are satisfied. Uh, you will see some patients with degenerative changes, but as Alfendris and others have shown, this doesn't always translate in, into symptoms. So that's the key. Um, I'll close with, this is a mountain peak. Those of you that like drinking Coors beer in the West, this is the iconic Coors beer peak, uh, Wilson Peak, which is 14,000 feet in front of, sits out in front of my house. And there's a quote, beyond mountains are mountains. So this is a quote from a book on Paul Farmer. Uh, and it's a Haitian proverb that as you solve one problem, another oftentimes will present. So I don't know that this is the end all. I think we have the ability to create in the future engineered graphs, off the shelf graphs. Um, I think there, there may be other solutions that come up to more anatomically uh, reproducing what we need. But for now, this has been in our hands a fairly reliable procedure. This is holiday time. We don't have reindeer in, in Colorado, but these are a couple of herds of elk that wander around on ranch on what we call Hastings Mesa. So I wish you all happy holidays and I'd love to get some feedback and questions and hope at least these tips will be helpful to you. And then in a minute, we'll turn it over to Scott uh, to talk about uh, therapy. So I will turn myself off and, and I will turn it over to Scott. Thank you very much, Dr. Hastings. And uh, thank you to AO North America for having me. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you tonight. Um, my name is Scott Gould, and I'm an occupational therapist and certified hand therapist at the Indiana Hand to Shoulder Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, the therapy objectives for treating patients who have undergone the hemihamate replacement arthroplasty uh, is first and foremost to protect the surgery, uh, more specifically preventing posterior stress to the PIP joint, uh, while allowing early range of motion with the overall goal of maximizing and restoring hand function. So these two studies uh, published in JHS uh, looked at the functional range of motion of the joints of the hand uh, and concluded in the first study that uh, 36 degrees of extension over 86 degrees of flexion uh, was functional. And in the second study, 23 degrees of extension over 87 degrees of flexion uh, was considered functional. Uh, as therapists and surgeons, uh, we appreciate excellent outcomes, uh, and these numbers help when setting goals for patients and evaluating our outcomes. <clears throat> so this therapy snapshot uh, is based on a combination of information from the fifth edition of the Diagnosis and Treatment Manual for Physicians and Therapists uh, and uh, collaboration with Dr. Hastings. Um, and he kind of touched on that collaboration between the patient, therapist, and the surgeon, uh, which I also believe is vital to a, an excellent outcome. Uh, so, so like anything, these timelines can be adjusted uh, based on the individual presentation. Uh, so ideally, we're starting these patients uh, three to five days post-op. Uh, the bulky dressing is removed, uh, baseline assessments of pain, edema, the wound, range of motion are taken. Uh, the patient is educated on home exercises, uh, starting with emphasis on short arc motion, then progressing to full arc. And uh, we place them in a post-operative splint, uh, which may either be forearm-based or hand-based, depending on the, the comfortability. Uh, ideally, placing the PIP joint in about 10 to 15 degrees of flexion uh, to prevent that posterior stress. At 10 to 14 days post-op, uh, we remove sutures and uh, go over scar massage with the patient. Uh, and at this time, we may downgrade them to a, a digital-based splint um, 
and then, oops, sorry, at three weeks, we're going to continue to progress their range of motion, uh, review scar massage. You may implement some modalities if needed. At four weeks, we are going to um, start to wean them out of their protective splint and uh, transition them into some buddy straps. And by six weeks, <clears throat> they should uh, be out of their protective splinting uh, during the daytime. We may add a nighttime extension splint <clears throat> if a lag is present. And we may also add dynamic flexion splinting uh, if, if flexion is limited. At 10 to 12 weeks, uh, we're going to add grip strengthening. And uh, 14 to 16 weeks, we're gonna discontinue the uh, nine extension splint if we're happy with extension. So these are some images of uh, some of the splints that we will place these patients in. Um, again, if they have some discomfort where the hamate was harvested, uh, we'll place them in a, a forearm-based splint to provide some wrist support. Uh, but if they're feeling pretty good, we may, we may just do a hand-based splint. Uh, and the key component here is, is you don't want to have the PIP in too much flexion, but you also don't want it fully straight or hyperextended, especially. And then this is a um, digitally based dorsal blocking splint uh, that we will transition the patient to. Uh, sometimes we'll also use this initially um, in complement to their uh, hand-based or forearm-based splint uh, just to let them do their exercises. Uh, the material on the left is called Dysum, and uh, that's a, a nice tip or trick for uh, your therapist uh, to keep the splint in place. It's a non-slip surface and you can just heat it with the heat gun and stick it inside the uh, inside of the splint. So this is a case study of a patient that, that I saw last summer, 23-year-old um, right-handed laborer uh, who sustained right middle and ring finger posterior PIP fracture dislocations following a motorcycle accident. Here you can appreciate his uh, radiograph preoperatively. And he underwent uh, right middle and ring hemihamate replacement arthroplasties uh, with harvest of bilateral hemihamates, which made this kind of an interesting case uh, with Dr. Reed Hoyer from the Indiana Hand to Shoulder, uh, Indiana Hand to Shoulder Center. And we followed him for 16 sessions between August of 2020 and December of 2020, um, which again, you know, I think ideally I'd like to follow these patients at least for three or four months just to make sure they, they, they really maximize their function. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is not his specific splint, but this is, I, I did fabricate a, a dynamic IP flexion orthosis uh, for him to help get a little bit more flexion at the six week mark. And then this is a video that he was kind enough to send me a few months ago. I apologize for the quality here, um, but he ended up with really good function. Um, he's a, a, as a drywall uh, installer and finisher, and uh, he has a new baby at home. So, but thank you so much for your time and um, appreciate any questions. All right. Well, thanks. Those are both uh, great presentations, and we'll uh, wrap up here and, and revisit our case. Um, so again, uh, similar to a number of the cases Dr. Hastings showed, and there's a question about it that we'll ask Dr. Hastings to answer. Uh, we often see these, these chondral injuries to the head of the um, proximal phalanx, and, and I just wonder, and we could maybe get Dr. Hastings to answer, um, if those ever require any specific treatment. But here's our case of the 16-year-old, and again, you see the base of the middle phalanx is this rough looking articular cartilage. Um, and then here's our graft. Um, I took a picture from the front, but again, as Dr. Hastings pointed out, um, recreating that, that uh, concavity is, is very important. And there you see the two little screws there. And then just sort of a quick picture to demonstrate, obviously before we closed, uh, restoration of her cascade. And there you see post-op. Um, I love that tip, uh, and I've used that over the years. This was a, one from a few years ago, but um, really trying to get that the angle um, of this to help kick you into that concavity. 
Uh, and there's the buttress, as Dr. Hastings mentioned there. Uh, and there you see her somewhat later. And there you see uh, final follow-up. Again, a little bit of extensor lag, but a pretty good functional result uh, for her. So, uh, Emil, if, uh, if there's any questions that have come in, again, Dr. Hastings, maybe uh, you could address, uh, you mentioned it, and, and we see the, those injuries to the head of the, the proximal phalanx. Um, anything that you've done over the years with those, other than look at them and lament? <laughs> yeah, you, you got it. <laughs> I, I haven't done anything with them, to tell you the truth. So, um, it's variable. It's, it's almost always there. I think the, the more chronic they are, the more you see, and the more acute they are, the less you see. And I think that's why the chronic ones tend to lead to more radiographic arthritis than the more acute ones. So I haven't done anything other than just deal with the base of middle phalanx. But a good question. Well, you have a couple of uh, questions. One of them was, uh... What do you do with the uh, FTS insertion, especially when you have to go further distal and maybe even put a plate on there? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the FTS still inserts distal to where we're working. So there's still sufficient room without messing with the FTS to apply a little mesh plate. So when I have to do something supplemental other than screws, then I use a little uh, one point 1.0 mesh plate or one and just and just trim it down to, to basically just what you need and that still fits proximal to the FDS. Um, the only issue with the FDS is is potentially the prominence of the distal part of the graft. So I think those of you that have done it will find that the graft the distal part of the graft as you've tipped it always is kind of prominent underneath the FDS and so that's what that's why I try to get the screws a little bit proximal to allows you to trim that down. And then I think if you interpose that retinacular flip, uh, flap, it's one more layer between the graft and the FDS. So in summary, I've never had to release or deal with the FDS. The graft still fits proximal to it, even if you have to apply a small plate, but the FDS can be, can be well, the graft can be kind of tight underneath the FDS and trimming it down helps to a certain degree, and perhaps putting that retina flap, retina flap will help to a certain degree too. Good so when question. You, when you put the screw in, do you countersink it to prevent the rubbing against the flexor tendon, or is it okay to be proud? Um, no, I don't think you should countersink it. These are 1.0 screws, and the head on the 1.0 is very small. When you get to 1.3, it becomes a little bit bigger. But the 1.0 uh, screws have a fairly low profile flat head and that really is, an, is not an issue. I fear if you were to countersink it, you're gonna, you're gonna lose some of your fixation in that, in that hamate. So I, I don't think you should do that. Yeah, another question they asked, uh, do you think the uh, CMC joint of the little and ring finger would develop any arthritis because of the surgery you had there? You know, we've never seen that. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's increasingly, you know, larger numbers of follow-ups in the literature. And basically, I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen or a report of a case where they had to do something for the CMC joint. Um, I think if you're really critical, there are a few studies that showed someone had a, just a mild ache there, but I've never seen it to be, never seen it to be an issue. Um, I think maybe because you know, you're still leaving the palmar part of the hamate. Um, you still have strong ligaments palmarly, and you still have in most hands a supple uh, ulnar, uh, ulnar sided uh, carpal joint uh, around the proximal hamate that, that leads to fairly supple ulnar hand that kind of protects that area. Um, so, well, yeah, I, I mentioned that I, I pinned the first one. I mentioned that it was a, a, a concern, and the, and the reassurance was. People do get by with a fused carpal metacarpal joint on that side of the hand really well. But if you look at the literature, uh, there have not been cases of, of harvesting problems. Okay. So what, what percentage of the joint do you think you take when you take the graft? So I have, a, I have another slide. I, I don't know if I have it in this talk. We looked at how much of the hamate you would need uh, 
uh, for a 50% defect. And obviously it's different index, middle ring and small digits, but pretty much always less than 50%. I see, okay. Yeah, so the I can't remember the exact figures as we calculated it. I pull up the slide, but it varied between thirty and fifty percent. Another question was uh, they wanted a better, uh, more tips of how to repair the roller plate back in in case of ORIF or hemi hemi hammer. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So I showed that one slide. The the roller plate as it comes distally, that fiber card latchness or the fibrous part of the roller plate gets really thick distally. So it's one and a half. Sometimes it's two, but usually one and a half millimeters thick. That's why sometimes you can interpose it into a defect that's not compressed very, very far and it'll, it'll function as a buttress. So I put one good suture, usually it's a 3-0 a braided nylon or a 4-0 braided nylon right at the, at the lateral distal apex of the volar plate. It's solid right there. And then if you just are careful in retracting the, the digital nerve, you basically have where you're, the palmer parts of your collateral attach right to that area and there's decent tissue that you can you can bring your needle through there i i also put more than one just on the corner so if you look at you look at the volar plate you know you put you put one on the distal corner one on the other but i usually will also put a couple in an angled fashion um, along the mid portion of the boulder plate, but basically attaching the accessory collateral back to the boulder plate. So you're with that angle, you're kind of dragging the boulder plate back into position. And that, that creates pretty good stability. So as I've applied lateral additional sutures, not just the distal apex, that makes your, that makes your repair pretty solid to the point where you can basically bring the joint all the way up into full extension. So we typically, prevent the last 10 or 15 degrees just to protect the boulder plate. But I think you'll get a sense if you if you supplement those distal apical sutures with one or more on the lateral margins of the boulder plate, place them at a little bit of an angle so it pulls the boulder plate distally, that creates a pretty secure fixation. You also mentioned that you re repair the collateral ligament and how, how important it is to repair them. No, I don't actually repair them. So, so as, as I showed, I take a blade in and release it off of the proximal phalanx. So it's just a subperiosteal proximal release. And it just settles right back into position once the joint's in, in position. So I think maybe you were alluding to repairing the volar plate to the insertion of the collateral ligament. And I may have said it backwards at one, at one point. And one other question is when many times when you have a fracture, the edge of a fracture is not straight, it's kind of a curve. Is it more Absolutely. important to make it straight or make the graft curve to match the <laughs> In most instances, it's simpler to just make it flat, make it straight. You know, it's, it's easier to, to put the graft in when you got a nice rectangular box-like defect. Um, I, I, the only exception of that is when there's a wide discrepancy. I showed you a slide where there was kind of an oblique orientation yeah. of the fracture where it looked like it was 50%, but it was really 60 or 70% on one side and less on the other. So if there's a big discrepancy on like, like that, then I will trim it at an angle like that. But technically it's easier if you can create a box-like structure. And I'd say the majority, more majority of cases are close enough that you're not sacrificing too much to create a box-like structure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Dr. Then, Hastings? Yeah. If you, if you were in an environment where you didn't have the access to these box plates that you showed, mm -hmm. is it reasonable to use threaded K wires, you think? Um, and cut them flush? For fixation, for fixation of the graft? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, 1.0 screw is just a fancy threaded K wire that yeah. has a head. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. You could use a threaded K wire, and that, that would work really well. You know, the 1.0 1. 1. screws are really low profile. The head is yeah. based, as we mentioned earlier, Jeff asked me, the head is really pretty flat and it just fits, you know, perfectly to it. It's a little safer with a 1.0 because it does have a head, but I think, a you know, threaded K wire, if you cut it flush, you know, would work too. I think probably the issue is trying to cut cut that properly, cut it, cut it absolutely flat because most 
most things we have to cut the screws are going to leave a bit of a burr or a little bit yes. of a prominence. Yes. I suppose you could cut it, withdraw it dorsally, but and where it and where it comes out dorsally, either a screw or a K wire, it comes out in the triangular ligament yes. area between the conjoin conjoin lateral bands. So so it comes out in that in that triangular area that's not going to affect your conjoined lateral bands on either side. Right. Right. Thank you. What is the maximum uh, defect that you can use this uh, graph with? <laughs> well, I showed you one of the more extreme ones, which was more like 80%. And that's, that's about it, I think. Um, and, but it, but it, does, it, it does create a flatter joint, the larger the defect. And that's why you even have to, you have to, you have to tip that graft even more. And that's where down the road, if we had another off the shelf or bioengineered graft or something that we could use, uh, you, could, you could match the anatomy a lot better. So about the highest I've done is like 80%. And again, I think, I think part of the problem with these, with looking at why volar plate arthroplasty fails is because a lot of those cases were you know, 40, 45, 40, 45% joints that, you know, once you got the joint reduced, we're going to function pretty well. Um, so I think, and, and also even, even in cases where we've been, you know, more critical and looking at the amount of joint involved, it's very hard to do that, to assess that accurately from just a lateral x-ray. I think, you know, you can assess it when you're in, intraoperatively really well, and you can with thin slice, one millimeter thin slice CT also. So I think I, I oftentimes or almost always will get a thin slice CT. Just gives me that much more information beforehand, mm -hmm. particularly if I'm looking at being able to reconstruct it without a bone graft, being able to put things back in to elevate, you know, depressed portions of the joint and so on. So thin slice CT can be a great tool for preoperative planning. And, but despite that, sometimes you don't know. You're just gonna have to go in uh, with the hope that you can fix it. And if you get in and it's too, too many small pieces, you can't fix it, then, then you've already talked to the patient about what you need to do. Uh, but I think, honestly, I think it's really hard to accurately measure and describe the amount of articular involvement. And I think that's what's led to the confusion on, on why volar plate arthroplasty works or doesn't work. Because even if you look at Eaton and even if you look at, at the, at uh, the initial series of just dorsal block splinting for PIP fractures. If you look at that initial paper, they were all less than 30 or 40 percent. Um, that's why dorsal block splinting got such so popularized. But but because it, because they didn't because people didn't really read the article carefully to know it, how much percentage was involved, people started using dorsal block splints for every cases, even though in that initial article on dorsal block splinting, uh, most almost all of them were. 30 or 40 percent or less. Yeah. And in your experience, what percent of this graph survive? Uh, is it always 100 percent? Do you see any resolution? Oh, I think I think it always survives. I showed you my own case with the radial stylate where it didn't, <laughs> but I have never really, I've never really seen it not survive. I've seen a couple of cases sent to me where you know, where it got loose, you know, and wasn't fixed well. Uh, and, and yeah, th that didn't work, but when they're fixed and there's, and there's a good distal buttress, it heals rapidly. And usually by, I don't know if I, I kind of passed over that hockey player where I put a plate on, but at the six week follow-up, that x-ray had all filled in. It was all, it was all healed at six weeks. So most all of them are pretty solidly healed at six weeks. Yeah. Good question. That's yeah, I think the hamate has a, a more open cancellous structure. And so it, 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 you know, just like, it's just like on a scaphoid, putting in a non-vascularized graft into a scaphoid, it'll revascularize if, you know, if it has the trabecular structure that's capable of revascularizing. And the same thing with this. I think there's another question. They said, if, if there's a hemihamate that uh, failed, do you do a repeat or do you go with a fusion? I think most of the time, if it's failed, you're you're out of, you're out of the ballpark. You're gonna have to do something else. I can't see doing it again. Um, you'd be going to the other hand. I know Scott just showed that, but um, I think most of the time, by they failed, you're gonna have additional soft tissue problems around the joint that probably not gonna work with a with a revised hamate. 
I can't say I've tried that, so someone may prove me wrong, but um, I kind of think that I think things are up at that point. Do you have any uh, uh, three ticks? Uh, I mean, uh, how to handle that little graph while you're contouring it? Is there any technique <laughs> you put a K wire or hold it with a special forcep or bone forcep? Yeah, I use it. You know, you can lose it, you know, so you got to be pretty darn careful. So that's a great comment. I use a, just a very small coker and apply it on the side, on, on either side of the coker, and then I'll manipulate it. But I'll still keep room on the operative table around that, you know, so that if, if you lose it and care, and I'll put it back and forth. But a small coker just on each side of the graph, the lateral sides of the graph, and then you can kind of rotate it and see what you need, what you need to do. And then you just trim it down slowly. So I usually start by, by creating the radial and ulnar cut so that the sagittal ridge in the middle lines up properly. And then, and then I will end up basically trimming the, the coronal cut so it tips the graph properly. And then when you put it in, it's way too prominent. And then just basically start trimming away the distal part of the graft until it kind of settles back down to the cartilage surface where it matches up properly. Do you use a saw or a rangeur or a bone cut? No, I use a, I use a very thin sagittal call, saw, saw. So a really thin sagittal call, Mi micro air saw or I don't know, whatever you happen to have, but very thin, um, but not a rangeur. No, I, I don't think you're gonna be able to safely contour that graft without a fine saw. Okay. Yep. That's yeah, fiddly. It's fiddly, but it works. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all the questions that was asked. All right. Well, we want to thank. I'd like, a, uh, I'd like any way to get a poll on how many people have done that in the audience. Mackenzie, is there a way to poll the audience to see if, if how many people have actually done a hemi hemi? Let's see how fast I can make this happen. <laughs> Maybe, we, maybe we're running out of time, but I'd In be real great. time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, Dr. Well, Hastings. Thanks, thanks for those questions. Time. They're very helpful. This is important. Jeff, let's make time for this. Sure. Let's see what uh, Mac can do here. And okay. if, while you're waiting for Max to do that, we can pose questions for the boss or a case. Okay. Dr. Hastings, we're not letting you go this easy. Come on. What do you want to know? You know, this is where we get to pick your brain for every last morsel of knowledge about this operation. Uh, I've got a question while we're waiting. Uh, what is, uh, how do you incorporate dynamic external fixator uh, in your practice? You know, in the range of injuries, PIP joint injuries, would you use a dynamic X fix? Uh, how would you do that? Yeah, so I'll often use something like that for for tenuous fixation. So let's say you go in and, and you can, you have a lot of pieces that you can put back into position, but they're not big enough to fix. Then I'll put a, a fixer on as a neutralization device to let you start moving the joint right away. So that's one easy scenario where I'll use it to supplement tenuous fixation. Um, I will use a fixator in that middle zone where, you know, where, where it's stable with 35 or 30 degrees of flexion. Um, and that and that it works well that way, letting the soft tissues heal. Um, I, I don't think that that dynamic fixation really works um, with these higher percentage injuries, like 50, 60%. Um, I mean, I've been down that path and unfortunately it hasn't worked. Uh, it will work. I think that these higher ones will they will work if you create a flexion contracture. So you get you can get a sense with these more severe injuries under floral, reduce them, and then slowly start bringing them up and see at point what point they start to subluxate. And if you decide you just want to create like a flexion contracture at that point, just like Scott said, people do people do okay with a 20, 30 degree flexion contracture at the PIP joint particularly on the owner side of the hand where there's more suppleness that'll make, you know, the, you know, with a, with a contracted joint, you, there's still enough flexibility in the small and ring that with a contracted joint, the fingers kind of out of the way. So, mm -hmm. so 
I think it's acceptable to, to, to decide to just create a small contracture and that keeps it stable without going, without going for a home run. So Bill and, and maybe Scott, at what point um, are you confident to start pushing on someone with an extensor leg, you know, with a flexion contracture? In other words, as you said, you know, you're not upset if at the end they wind up with a little bit, but if you see 30 degrees at a week and a half, how aggressive can we get with them? Good question. I, I think that that's where you got to talk to your surgeon. So if the surgeon really feels that the volar plate is pretty secure, then I think I think you could push them right away. Um, um, most of these are going to have enough scar that they're not going to fall into hyperextension. And probably if, if the volar plate sucked back a little bit or didn't heal all the way, they're probably still going to do okay. I'm, I'm very comfortable with pushing on them for flexion. So, so if you, if you, if you could push on the, on the middle phalanx at, you know, just beyond the joint, all you're doing is helping reduce the joint. So I'm very comfortable with passive flexion applied to the middle phalanx. Um, extension, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere th three weeks out or so, then I start, start working on that. Yeah, and I think and as we've gotten more experience, we, we, we're more, we're, we're more likely not to put them in much flexion post-op, just 10 degrees or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll prioritize flexion for sure um, before I will start pushing extension. Uh, probably would be a minimum of two months before I would even uh, approach the surgeon about it. Um, I would, you know, I think a, a good night, night extension splint is a really nice way to balance that, um, especially if you have them in a dynamic splint, uh, you, don't, you don't want to worsen the lag. So once they come out of their protective splint, you know, nine times out of 10, I'm putting those patients in a night splint regardless, uh, just to kind of, for a checks and balances system. Yeah, and some of that depends on how you've held them to start with. If you hold them pretty straight, like at 10 or 15 degrees, when they come out of the dressing, they're not going to, you're not going to be fighting a big flexion problem. You know, you're, they're already, they're already pretty straight. Um, so you want to make sure when you put on your post-operative dressing that you have them pretty straight up to 10 degrees or something like that. Then you're not trying to overcome like, you know, a significant contracture. Yeah. All right, Dr. Hastings. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I understand from uh, Mackenzie, we're, we're not going to be able to, to uh, engineer that okay. poll. So sorry about that. It was a, a great question. And um, so I, I do want to thank all of our participants tonight. Uh, great questions, great discussion. Dr. Hastings, Scott, uh, excellent presentations. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I hope everyone enjoys their upcoming holidays and then will uh, rejoin us in January uh, as, our, um, as our webinars continue. So good evening.